pleasure to welcome in, to welcome the Universidad de Sevilla to this uh, program to Defensa IO. This is the third edition. Um, this is a program that we've um, launched thanks to the support and partnering with the Embassy of the U.S. in Spain. And it's been it's a pleasure for us to be able to to hold all these sessions with you students at the Spanish universities, trying to convey the importance of uh, being aware, learning, and, and knowing more about security and defense. Understanding that security and defense these days goes beyond military uh, things, goes beyond the army, and um, applies to everything. You have been um, following things like this information. Some of you with her may be studying journalism. We have been following misinformation. We have been following um, hybrid threats. We have been following the threat posed by climate change. All those things affect our security. So it's a, as I said, it's a pleasure uh, and I think very relevant to share all these issues with you. As you know, in the session today, we are going to talk to talk about uh, NATO and European defense. And for that, we couldn't have someone more um, more interesting and more knowledgeable and better placed than Ambassador Kate Burns. Uh, Ambassador Burns is a, is a current civilian deputy and um, foreign policy advisor to US uh, European Command. Uh, but she knows very well, of course, um, the dealings of NATO and the dealings of Europe uh, as a whole. She has been posted in, in different places in different countries here in Europe. The last one as ambassador of the US to North Macedonia. But as it was mentioned before, she also spent some time here in Spain where we I had the pleasure to meet her. So ambassador, uh, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure, it's an honor. Uh, then just let me tell you a couple of words about the dynamics of this session. Ambassador will speak for a while, will share with us her insights on, on this topic, and then we will open the floor to your questions. For those of you in the room, you can approach um, the computer, you can ask the questions directly. For those of you online, I will ask you to make or to ask me for the floor via the chat or just directly put your question in the chat and I, then I will either read it or, or, or put you on, on screen, depending on, on, on the, the time we have and on where you are at that time. But I really encourage you to make questions. This program and these debates are much rich with uh, your questions and your insights and your knowing what is of interest for you. With a further, with a further ado, Ambassador De Flores Dio, thank you very much again. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, first of all, to the organizers for enabling this session. It's wonderful to work with old friends, um, but it's also great to meet new friends through this format. So I appreciate your introduction to all of this. I wish that I could be there with you in Sevilla, uh, not least because of beautiful weather and the wonderful food and the great environment there. Um, but, uh, you know, we have so many ways to bridge uh, distance these days um, and communication and, and, and technology is part of that. So we're really not so far away after all and neither is language. And, you know, a credit to all of you for taking on these very difficult discussions in a language that is not your mother tongue, um, but I think we're all improved by them. And again, language should never be the limiting factor. Um, I wish I could express uh, all of this in, in Spanish. Um, I would love to try, but I appreciate what you're trying to do. And, and, and as I said, I'm very open. I will offer some opening remarks, but I really do believe, as Christina emphasized, this is just an opportunity for you to have to formulate some questions to ask me because we all benefit the most from that level of discussion and that question of answer. So I will speak for a while, but my, my hope is that that will just stimulate, stimulate some of the questions. And please, you know, if I'm not addressing an area that's of interest to you, direct me to where your interests are because that's where this conversation should go. Um, you are the future of our security relationship and the issues that are on your mind are what should be driving our political leaders mind when they come and they meet and they address some of these topics and when we have these discussions about the security the future security of our euro atlantic space it's your issues and your concerns that should be in the forefront of those discussions so now um, let me launch into just sort of where we are um, i do sit in an unusual position as christina described I'm a professional diplomat so you know my intent is to work on relationships and most of my career has been spent working 
with Europe, on Europe, about Europe uh, and its relationship with the United States in one form or another. And so when I say this, I'm, I mean this from a deeply personal way, as well as a policy position, this is an unprecedented time in the Euro-Atlantic arena. Um, we are going through fundamental changes, which my generation is only beginning to grasp the extent of based on the historical experience that we bring. Um, we see the security environment in Europe as one that's going to continue to involve and that will require an enduring focus, not just on foreign policy and defense policy, but on this broader idea of security um, and the definition of security that goes much beyond sort of the traditional areas of studies that I grew up with when I was sitting in your position uh, at a university. So what the work of Defense in Yo, EO and, and other organizations in your university professors are doing is helping broaden this conversation. So as we approach the future, we're as well informed as ever. Now I started by saying that this is an unprecedented time in Euro-Atlantic security. Much of this was precipitated or caused by Russia's invasion or reinvasion of Ukraine. This was an illegal, unprovoked, attack by Russia across the borders of Ukraine, violating fundamental principles on which we have, as the Euro-Atlantic community have not only stood on, but built on for years, this concept that your, that your homeland should be protected. That was just rammed right through by Russia in February 24th, 2022. And the effect that that had on galvanizing us was profound. But I would argue that that isn't as important a turning point as what happened a few months later, not far from where you all are sitting in Madrid at the NATO summit in Madrid. So while Ukraine was the forcing issue that brought us to the table, it was that coming together at the table in Madrid and the adoption of a brand new strategic concept for NATO that has redefined the moment as we move forward. At that summit, uh, what NATO did was basically put at the top of NATO's agenda for the first time in 35 years, the priority of collective self-defense and co the concept of territorial defense as the foremost function of our NATO alliance. And for those of you who have some experience with the history of all of this, that's where NATO started. It was about protecting ourselves, about creating this shared sense of defense that we build together and that we come together and we inform together and then we defend together. And this is what this uh, Madrid summit did. And if you read the summit declaration, it's actually a very ambitious set of agreements that the political leaders committed us to. I think a lot of the focus was on the very clear messaging about Russia's aggression as it should be in that moment in time. Um, about their, the full support and solidarity of NATO for Ukraine and for its heroic defense of its country. Again, this got a lot of headlines at the time, uh, as well as the encouragement of allies to support Ukraine's effort. But what's truly important there is what we're fighting for, um, because it's not just about Ukraine. It's about everything that's wrapped up in those principles. And what Russia did in violating Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity is truly a threat to all of us that we must now defend against. And so when you see our leaders step up, our country step up, our, our citizens step up in support of Ukraine, we keep in the back of our mind that there's something broader behind this. Of course, it's human solidarity um, for the victims of Russia's aggression in Ukraine. It is admiration for the courage that Ukrainians have shown in defending their homeland. Um, but it is also a recognition that this could happen to any one of us um, and that, you know, and that we need to be prepared to face that as a collective community. And it's changing the conversation and we see it on a daily basis. I was in uh, shape just this last week on Tuesday and Wednesday having conversations with NATO leaders, just a profound different space. Incidentally, I was also in Brussels having conversations with EU officials. And while we're not an EU member, you know, the United States has a vested interest. And so we are now breaking down barriers because the conversation is now about that same sense of security. 
So, you know, I think that's important to keep in mind. And I would love to talk a little bit more about what NATO stands for, because I think sometimes that's lost um, in the discussion today. And so I hope there are some questions about uh, NATO and Article 5 and what this means when we stand together and what it looks like as we go forward, because NATO is going to change as a res in response to what the political leadership has set out for us. Um, and so you will see uh, new regional plans uh, that are being introduced and hopefully adopted by political leaders soon. Those will come with some new force requirements as we try to deal with the, the, the intensity, the gravity and the complexity of the threats that we face moving forward. Um, but you'll also see some wonderful areas for cooperation that I think will, will firmly bring us together. Now, our cooperation within NATO um, is actually very closely tied with our cooperation as bilateral partners. So one of the interesting things about my position is I serve as a foreign policy advisor to General Kavoli, who wears both hats. He is both secure, so the commander of all NATO forces, but he is also the commander of the U.S. forces in Europe. And so he is responsible for the U.S.'s relationship with each of the member countries in Europe, allies, partners, um, all of them. Uh, and that gives us a great opportunity. So we can work bilaterally with the countries as partners. We can work within NATO as partners because he understands that at the end of the day, the U.S. forces present in Europe are effectively the U.S. are NATO. So we are one and the same. So when, for example, with your country, with Spain on a bilateral basis, as exercises in training, um, in opportunities, fundamentally at the backbone of this, for our two countries at least, is seamlessly together. And what we do uh, as the United States and Spain should be consistent with and complementary with what we do together in the alliance. However, we have advantages in our bilateral relationship that also can help us inform each other as partners. I had the opportunity um, to visit Madrid just a few months ago in February with General Cavoli in his Sakir hat. And we came and we had a set of discussions that focused a lot on NATO contributions. So on the incredible things that Spain has been doing to reinforce its Eastern flight neighbors by providing um, assistance, uh, not just to Ukraine, which was a, a separate and important part of our conversation, but also the, the deployment of Spanish forces in the Baltic area. Um, the role that Spain plays in air policing throughout the Eastern flank. Um, all of this is extremely important in our NATO context, but we were also able to have very significant conversations about other areas of security interest to the United States outside of the NATO context. And here I would say we were very enlightened listening to our Spanish partners on their concerns about what's happening in the Western Sahel and how all of these issues also have to be part of our conversation. To some degree, they're part of the conversation within NATO and, and Spain has been one of the countries leading on the issues of the South, uh, uh, to the South of Europe to make sure that the broader NATO alliance is leaning on this. But we also have European, I mean, we have military interests in North Africa, uh, in the Gulf of Guinea and elsewhere where we may partner with Spain separately and outside of NATO, and that's critically important to us. So it's by bringing together these different threat perceptions, both in the bilateral relationship and in the NATO relationship that we better serve each other as partners. So that's a huge part of what we do and what we learn by interacting. Um, and you know, to go to Christina's point as well, even though we represent the uniform military presence here uh, in Europe and in our relationship with Spain, we define security much more broadly. So we're talking about things like health security and response and the outsized role that our militaries can play, for example, as they did during the COVID-19 pandemic and helping move supplies around the world. That is part of what we do. 
Um, the support for refugees, uh, obviously the great support that, uh, that Spain provided to, to Ukrainian refugees who came, but on a daily basis to refugees um, and asylum seekers that come up from North Africa, or when we had to evacuate Afghanistan, the pivotal role that Rhoda played in helping us get uh, some of these, these most endangered, most threatened women and children in many cases to a place of safety until we could determine their onward destination. These are the kinds of conversations that will have to continue to take place in our bilateral relationship as well as in our NATO relationship because they contribute to this greater concept of security. The final piece that I would want to mention is also the people to people engagement um, that is so important and where we learn from. So um, just uh, last week, uh, General Williams, who was our four star general in charge of all of the US Army forces for Europe and Africa was in Zaragoza. And he had an opportunity while he was there to participate not only in an exercise and to see how we were working together in a multinational, not NATO, but a multinational basis. But he also had an opportunity to speak with some of the Spanish military cadets and to talk about the same way I hope we will talk about today, issues that matter to them as we think about, about building our NATO, our security forces and our structure for the security threats of the future. And so I'm going to end a little bit uh, where I started, which is you all have an outsized role to play in that. First of all, your country has an outsized role to play with that. In the next couple months, in July, two very important things are gonna happen. And I will argue they are equally important. Number one, NATO political leaders are gonna meet again at the Vilnius summit, and they're gonna have an opportunity to pull out that document from the Madrid summit look at the political pledges that have been made and assess how we have come as an alliance in terms of meeting those commitments. So that will be a very important conversation. At the same time, in that same month, Spain is going to be assuming the presidency of the EU at a time when I would argue not only the United States and the EU relationship is on a profoundly positive path forward, but so is the NATO and EU relationship moving forward based on a new agreement. And so some of the discussions that will take place outside of NATO, outside of the military, under your EU presidency will profoundly affect many of the security issues that we're facing today, whether that's civilian security, migration and humanitarian issues, it could be climate issues and how those have a direct effect on our homeland and our national defenses uh, at home, economic security, cyber security, all of these realms, which to some degree or another, our military of course has a role to play, but our whole of government has a responsibility as espoused in those commitments that we have now pledged to in Madrid that we are gonna take on as a community. So I really think that you all are at the start of a whole new era and you know, I think about when I joined my foreign service 30 years ago, it was after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we had a new relationship with Europe. You are coming in as leaders in a brand new moment in the Euro-Atlantic space, and you will help define what these relationships look like going forward, both in terms of the content and what is on the agenda, but also in terms of those relationships that you built with probably classmates of yours right now who represent other countries and other perspectives, but also in the networking relationships that you have around the world, you are gonna help build that fabric that ties us together for the next 30 to 50 years. And so um, we really look to you uh, to help us form some of these uh, answers. Um, we're just beginning to write the questions um, and, and to figure out uh, you know, what we need to ask. And we're gonna look to all of you to fill that space. So I hope that you will find this discussion useful and I really welcome you, encourage your questions in any direction and to help inform our thinking. So with that, I will stop speaking and I will start listening. And I hope that you will have some very provocative things to say, thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Very, very interesting, especially because not so frequently we have the chance to understand the relationship between the macro NATO um, workings and the bilateral and how that
play together. And, uh, you know, it's, a, 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 it's been also very enlightening, I think, in, in, in the sense of how a diplomat plays a role in this uh, military alliance. Um, I, as, as we mentioned, we are expecting your questions either via the chat, via uh, the classroom, but let me kick off with some issues that you've raised and I think uh, maybe also interesting for the students. You've mentioned how important for us and for you is the Western Sahel. One of the major achievements from the Spanish point of view was the inclusion in that new strategic concept of the idea of the Southern flank and how that is also important. And it was especially important in a time where, as you stress, we were dealing, or we are still dealing with a war in the Eastern flank of, of Europe. Can you tell us a little bit more, what does that mean? What, how is NATO and how is the US getting involved in the, in the concerns about the, what is happening in the South of Europe? in the north of Africa. So let me take sort of what we call the 5,000 foot level aspect of this question first. And I think, I think this is not for media reporting. So this is just my thinking, but you know, the, the argument that the countries to the south matter to the security of Europe is not a new one. That's, I mean, Spain and, and, and other countries uh, in the South have been arguing this for years. Uh, when I worked at the OSCE, uh, a lot of other countries were arguing, we need to focus on this issue. But for a long period of time, NATO was structured and geared towards out of area deployments. So the conversation about parts of the globe that were not within the territory of the Euro-Atlantic space were considered out of area deployments. And that was a difficult thing for NATO allies at whatever number they were to the period of time as it's grown from 28 to 30 to now 31 to take on. With this new concept of territorial defense, now all of a sudden an argument that your country has been making for many years um, started to gain new traction here because it was reframed. Because the problems in Western Sahel and the problems in North Africa will soon become problems of territorial defense and if they are not addressed at the root. And so this has changed and I think opened up a new space. Now, some of the answers, um, whether they're military or political or economic will have to take place in Africa, in Western Sahel, because that's where the locus of the problem is. And, and so you need to address it with the players. But that doesn't mean you can isolate that problem from the territory of Europe, because you have to think about the effects that have happened. So I think, you know, one of two things, uh, or, or some of the discussions, let me put it this way, that are taking place. And again, some of these are bilateral, some of these are multinational, but not NATO. And then within NATO, there's also some discussion about how do we how do we do better at all of this? So for example, the EU has played an outsized and extremely important role in certain parts of uh, in Africa with respect to conflict in a way that neither the United States nor NATO has. We said uh, we're in here at European Command, well, just down the road, not very far from here, is the seat of Africa Command, um, which is also run out of Germany for very many different reasons. And some of our commanders, not General Cavoli, but our US Air Force commander, um, uh, our naval commander to some degree, and our, and our army commander, they wear dual hats, and they have to deal with Europe and Africa at the same time. And sometimes they've admitted to us, they're talking to European partners more often about Africa than they are about Europe, depending on the nature of the conversation. So there's opportunities both to look at where have we had success, much of our approach from Africa, and again, I don't work at Africa and I don't, I don't speak to uh, or you know, pretend to, to represent them, but they, do a much better job of partnering the military, um, we call it the defense, the diplomacy, and the development piece together as a three-part model in their engagements in Africa and bring that whole of government solution together uh, on the ground up 
Whereas we in Europe tend to start with the security piece and then the others pull in some of the others and it becomes together more organically, whereas they make it a strategic point of view. So I think there's some opportunities there. There's certainly some opportunities in training of security forces, and we've done that on a bilateral basis, but also in partnership with the EU, because in many cases you have some countries that are working directly bilaterally. Some are working through EU training missions and we now have the ability to augment some of those EU training missions, um, which is a great freedom and a, and, a, and a great partnership opportunity for us. And I think another space, which is which is maybe hasn't quite been developed, but something that NATO is looking at, whether or not it'll be ready in time for the Vilnius summit or, or, or not is, is an open question, but longer term down the road, is could we play a role in security sector reform? And by this, I mean, the organization of ministries of defense and the civilian oversight and infrastructure of security. Um, so there's many different areas that we can cooperate. Uh, and, and so again, I, I don't want to speak to the specifics of either a region or a part of that problem set, but just to identify the fact that what we have found in this new space and in this new political guidance is the ability to have conversations and to think beyond the parameters of purely NATO or purely EU or purely bilateral that we had to some degree been constrained to in the past. Thank you so much for this very clarifying view of, of what that means. I have a question here from Javier Gutierrez Gallego. He cannot connect. He says he has a, an unstable uh, connection and he has asked me to, to read the question first. Of all, he, uh, he thanks us, the organizers for this event um, uh, and for setting up these spaces. His question, um, he says, we have talked about international security, but we have priority focus on security in terms of war. He wants to ask how involved is NATO in the energy downturn that could lead to conflicts between countries when the time comes. And we are, you know, here in Europe, we are, very much aware of, of, of what energy shortages and conflicts are right now. Um, he also asks, um, in other words, how is it working or what measures are being considered to ensure energy security? And if that has anything to do with what you do at, uh, these days. So great question, Christina, you faded out a little, at a, at a, a little bit at the beginning. I think I got it, so I'll try to answer it, but, but Javier, if I don't get your question, please let me know and, and I'll do a re-attack as we call it, um, or I'm learning, I'm learning some new military technology working in this environment. So first of all, um, let me go back to NATO um, uh, and, and remember that, you know, the goal of, of European command has always been to be prepared to fight if we need to, to defend our alliance. But our number one goal is to avoid war and crisis and conflict. So it is to get ahead of the problems. And, and again, that's what the concept of deterrence is all about. It is to be, to present a strong picture so that your adversary doesn't even begin to think about threatening um, and, 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 and attacking you because they know that it will cost them dearly uh, to do so. And I would say, you know, from the U.S. perspective, we want them to know they're not going to win. And I think, you know, that's our message when it comes to all of this. So extend the some, somewhat similar thinking when it comes to energy security. So the most important thing that we can do when we talk about energy security is to really have an honest look at the vulnerabilities that exist and figure out how do we defend against them, not from one particular adversary, but from any threat. And this is where it starts to get complicated, but also critically important. So when we look at Ukraine, we learned a lot of lessons about how an adversary can use one's energy dependencies against them. And you know what we saw was horrifying. I, I think truly it shocked many of us that, that, that a government would go after the civilian energy, the, po the power, the food, the water that the, the civilians depend on as a weapon of war. Um, that was shocking for us to see in a European environment. Um, but it did bring home the fact that there are some physical vulnerabilities that we have 
that are infrastructure based that we need to defend against. So part of the discussions that we're now having amongst ourselves in NATO is how do we help each other defend against all of this? Now, this is tricky because energy infrastructure is, to use an EU term, a national competency. Um, and it's not necessarily something that the Ministry of Defense is in any way authorized, let alone encouraged to take the leadership responsibility for. So, you know, it's going to be tricky. But I think sharing those lessons learned is very important. Now, I talked about a direct attack on infrastructure. Well, there are also other kinds of attacks on infrastructure. We certainly felt them in the United States in the cyberspace. Um, uh, uh, and sorry, 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 Ambassador, some, okay, now it's, there we go. sorry. So part of it again is having a conversation about those kind of vulnerabilities that exist within our structures and how we can go about and protect them. And all of us have had different experiences. Um, and to the degree that we trust each other and are able to share that information, and that's a big, you know, that's a big question mark. We're still working through that right now. We could learn a lot from each other in terms of expertise. Now, there are other threats to energy, and this is one of the other lessons we learned in Ukraine, and that's supply and your supply chain and where you're getting your energy from. And would it be used against you as a political weapon? As Christina mentioned, you know, previously I had I had served in the Western Balkans and we had been warning for many years before 2022 about the dangers of relying on a single country that has regularly used the flow of gas and oil as a political weapon. Um, because if you if you create that kind of dependency, you enable a country to make those decisions for you. So well before the Russia's second invasion of Ukraine and this you know fundamental shift, we had already said, don't be reliant on somebody who's going to use that against you. There was also the lessons of COVID-19, right, and the ability to move things across borders. Again, nothing to do with an adversary. Um, we are now in uh, in. Uh, European Command preparing for an exercise that is going to look at climate risks to energy movement and other movement across Europe. So again, nothing to do with an adversary, but a threat to all of this. So what can we do in the NATO space? Again, it depends on the NATO political leaders. How much do we want to do as a collective alliance? How much do we want to have those conversations? in a group of 31, how comfortable are we are sharing our national vulnerabilities? And I would argue that, you know, we're probably gonna find some space in between. Um, but I think that what we have all learned is that particularly when it comes to energy, there are very few countries that can rely only upon themselves for their energy needs. Even the United States, which has, um, a very rich energy mix and sources of it, its own is still part of the energy picture question because uh, of its relationships, trade and otherwise to some of its key partners and because it depends on its partners' energy security to be strong in other areas. So for example, when we faced you know, the Ukraine crisis and we saw European partners struggling with how were they gonna meet their energy needs for the winter, our policy folks said, hey, we need to care about this because if we need their support on Ukraine and everything else, then we need to be prepared to at least be sympathetic and hopefully facilitative of their efforts to move things forward. And so there was a discussion about, you know, making sure some of that our LNG exports were re-diverted to Europe. Is there a profit aspect of this? Of course, there's part of that as well, but there is also a policy piece. So I would say we're at the beginning of a much more comprehensive discussion about energy security. We're at beginning to build confidence in each other in terms of sharing uh, some of those solutions. I think there's going to be have to be an acknowledgement, particularly for some of the, and I'll say uh, smaller economies, not countries, but sm some of the smaller economies about the kinds of investments that they're going to make as they try to have a rich and diverse mix uh, in their portfolio because their grids 
may not be sustainable without some interdependence, but interdependence is not dependence. And so I think you know, we have to get to the point where, where we look at this holistically. And one of the things that we're trying to do on the United States side is look at our relationships, um, figure out what's happening in the EU space among EU countries and EU partner countries, where the investments are going and making sure that we're coming up with solutions that neither duplicate nor complicate, um, but actually support all of our allies and partners having a level of energy resilience that's extremely important. There is actually in the Madrid summit declaration an entire paragraph devoted to resilience. And that resilience has not yet been defined. That is one of the tasks that the political leaders will have to take forward in Vilnius at the next summit is to begin to build out what does this look like? And to what degree does NATO want to be involved in this in terms of infrastructure decisions or other decisions? And so I think you're gonna see the political leaders grapple with this for some period of time. Much of this work will not be done in that part of Brussels. It may be done in other parts of Brussels. It'll be done in G7 plus formats. It'll be done um, in other discussions. But the idea at least is to at least bring these conversations into the same space so they're no longer competing with each other. I don't know if that answered your question, I, but I hope so. It was a, a great point. Yeah, and I so think much. it was a great answer. Let me tell you, and, and I think this is known by everyone that Europe uh, could, could tackle the last winter energy crisis, thanks to the US and the, and the LNG uh, gas coming from there. And without that, we would have been in a much, much worse position. Uh, let me also share with, with the students that we, are, we have held two sessions, at least two sessions that I recall on energy and security within this Defense IO program. So if you are interested, you, I invite you to to look at the videos in the website because in the in our website uh, in in the space for the this program because those were very very interesting sessions. Um, you said you had a question. Do you can you open your mic or do you want me to read it? I see no reaction, so I'll read the question. Um, he says, "What is the U.S. formula formula in its relations with Spain and Morocco?" You are, uh, uh, you are still muted. Sorry, I'm trying to, the US formula in its relationship yeah. with Spain and Morocco? Right, you know that this is this question had to come, being in Spain. <laughs> yeah, um, so I mean, I, again, I, I have to, be, uh, if, if, if we were really on the record, I would, you know, do what any ambassador does, which is say, I would have to defer to my, colleagues, the U.S. ambassador in Spain and the U.S. ambassador to Morocco to answer that question. Um, because that's just the protocol respect that, that we offer each other. But I will say this, um, we find it very possible to have constructive and positive relationships with multiple partners on any given time. And I think we're better informed by having bilateral relationships sometimes that are focused on a set of bilateral issues. Then we're better informed when with those bilateral partners, we can have broader conversations about the regions that they're in. So um, again, I have, I've never had the opportunity to serve in Morocco or anywhere in North Africa. I did have the opportunity to serve in Spain. And I think my colleague, Nicole, um, is on this call from, from the embassy in Madrid. So I certainly don't want to get in trouble by getting into Ambassador Reynoso's space. Um, but I will say that uh, while I was there, and I certainly believe it to be the case right now, we were able to have very productive conversations on a bilateral basis with Spain about all of its neighbors and about all of its concerns, whether they were in, um, in Europe, uh, in North Africa, in South America, in Central America, and frankly, in the Indo-Pacific as well. So, you know, I don't, I don't see a tension there uh, in any way whatsoever. Um, and again, you know, we also have very close relationship with countries in Europe who are not NATO members. Um, and those are important relationships, but they are distinct um, from those countries with which we both have a very close an important bilateral relationship and 
a treaty bound Article 5 relationship, uh, as in NATO, uh, as is the case in Spain, obviously. Thank you. There is another question here also related to the southern flank. Um, uh, he says, Andres Rodriguez is uh, uh, he, who puts the question, what do you think about the strengthening the defense of the borders in relation to irregular immigration as a collective defense measure? And he states, especially on the southern border of Europe, where the, where I, where the continent, I understand, is most vulnerable. So I think, and I think the question is about in terms of a, a NATO collective defense agreement on securing borders. So this would be a very difficult thing. I mean, I'm being very honest. Um, um, if you think about um, uh, the fact that the North Atlantic Alliance, it begins with North Atlantic, by the way, includes a broad part of the United States. So I think, you know, from us and our perspective, there would be no expectation of Canada coming to help defend the southern border of the United States, let alone Estonia, um, providing forces along that border. I know it's understood a little bit differently in Europe, both because of the, the smaller geographic distances and the ease of movement from, of people from one country to another that creates other things. So I, I think that it's probably that in and of itself is probably not a NATO conversation. Um, and of course, there are other organizations uh, that do look, uh, multilateral organizations that look at these things, EU, uh, Schengen, Interpol. Um, so a, a lot of different uh, um, uh, arrangements that can be made that would allow for some multinational support. But I think that um, uh, the value uh, of NATO is more in the consultative format in what we call the Article 3 and Article 4 parts of NATO, which are the ability of any country to bring an issue of security concern to the attention of its allies and ask for reasonable support that makes sense. Um, and that is an open invitation. Uh, and and you know um, and something that I think uh, is worthy of discussion. So there's certainly a space to remind folks that fundamentally border security is homeland security. Certainly, you'd have no argument with any politician in Washington D.C. that that is an important point. But I don't think you would see a politician in Washington understand NATO's role in that. And I think that that's probably the perspective of some of the other countries in Europe with respect to the southern border or the northern border as well. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Finland has just joined um, uh, NATO with the longest border of Russia uh, in this part of Europe. Um, uh, and I don't think border security in that respect would be necessarily something that we put on the table. So for now, I think the patrolling, the policing of the borders will remain a national competency with some international cooperation on very specific information, uh, on very specific issues. Where I think there are opportunities are intelligence sharing, right? Because we do have uh, common pictures that we can share about what we're seeing. There's political engagement in terms of understanding the trends. There's possibly some economic alignment and cooperation that can help address some of the root causes on the other side. There's training um, aspects because some of our NATO allies have particular expertise in the training of police forces and also um, expertise in preparing the civil society organizations that have to also be part of the conversations about border security because of course at the end of the day we're talking about human beings moving across the border. So I think there's a lot of opportunities for discussion and cooperation short of actual discussions about border security. If that answered the question, I hope so. Thank you. Marie Cruz, I don't know whether you have any question from there or any student in the classroom who wants to make any question. I, I cannot hear you. If not, you still have some issues here that you have been raised, uh, raising throughout your conversation. And if you allow me, I, I see someone moving there. Is, is that a question? Okay. 
Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll go with my question afterwards. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for that conference. And I, got, I want to thank you for this speech. It's more interesting. Um, my question is, yeah? okay, uh, my question is that. No se me escucha. Si me escucha, no se me escucha. Te oíamos bien, eh, te oíamos bien. Ah, vale, vale, vale. Okay, uh, my question is this. Uh, <coughs> How do you view the role of NATO in ensuring the security of European Union? And what specific actions are being taken to address potential threats to European Union? Hmm. Let me see how I'm going to go after that question. All right. So uh, if I come at this historically, we see NATO and the European as two organizations that developed for different purpose. So NATO had a very specific collective defense mission for a long period of time. Um, and that's fundamental. And that is the fact that at the end of the day, we have a shared system of values that we will agree to defend together. Um, and that is respect for, for territory, for sovereignty, that is basic human rights that we all agree to. Um, and then over time, we have given NATO some opportunity to do some additional things like training and all of that. It's in that latter space where for a period of time, there was overlap with the European Union, what was, which was founded on a very different set of bases. And I, I am no uh, expert on the European Union, but that was intended to bring European countries together in a much broader conversation, first on economic, economic and trade matters, and then increasingly in the political space, and to find areas in which by national decision, certain leadership and policy roles would be given over to the EU on behalf of the EU member states, over which the EU member states would exercise their voice through a specific set of mechanisms. So it had a much broader mandate, which was far more comprehensive from the start. There have been times for NATO and the EU to cooperate on very practical things like training missions, like humanitarian delivery, Delivery. NATO doesn't provide humanitarian assistance, but sometimes it can provide the mechanism uh, for delivery of assistance, including, by the way, for the EU. So there have been areas for cooperation, but NATO's fundamental principle was not to defend the European Union, either as a geographic designation or as a intellectual construct or political organization. Um, so that hasn't been as fun. But I would argue that to some degree, it is NATO's responsibility to defend those values that also lie at the heart of the European Union. So it's tangential and it's aligned, but it's not, its mission is not necessarily to defend the EU. I think there's a responsibility of our political leaders because there are investments in both organizations to make sure that one's commitments to NATO, if you are a NATO member, and one's commitments to the EU do not conflict with each other. Um, because at the end of the day, we are seeking a peaceful world, but we are pursuing it through a different set of tools and mechanisms. Again, in the NATO space, it's primarily based on this concept of territorial defense, deterrence of aggression, protection of critical assets, in the European Union, it's about the protection of a way of life. These are very similar, but they come out at very different approaches. So the, the, the expanse of the EU is going to, by nature, by definition, and by intent, always be much broader than is NATO. And it will have a membership that is different. And some countries want to be members of the EU, some don't. Um, same with NATO, right? But both organizations, by the way, have partnership arrangements with almost all of the same countries in Europe and relationship with countries outside of Europe. So I think increasingly 
we are getting less constrained by the obstacles of the organizations and more inspired by the opportunities for synergy that exist within them. That doesn't mean they're issues. Actually, uh, looking at my executive office here, we spent the day talking about issues of logistics and mobility and everything else. And there are still some issues when we try to do something in a NATO environment where we come up against EU regulations that are difficult and frustrating and, and bureaucratic. And we may have bilateral arrangements at work, but we come up with an EU arrangements. But those are just problems to work through. The intent, again, at the end of the day, goes back to the principles on which we were founded the principles on which the EU was founded. And I think sometimes we let the political rhetoric get in the way of the pragmatic rec recognition that we have a lot in common, um, even as we try to pursue different agendas. I know that didn't quite answer your question, but I also defend the European Union. Member states will do a just fine job on that. Um, there are going to be things that the EU will want to do in the defense space out, maybe with NATO, but maybe not necessarily in NATO. That's fine, as long as we're having that conversation and I think we're aligned in the same goals. Unfortunately, that's the direction I see us moving in. That really leads into my question, the question I, I, had, I, um, I, I had wanted to ask you. Um, I'll, I'll just present it and then also I'll read another question from, from the students, but I cannot avoid asking you about um, how you see the concept, the European concept of uh, strategic autonomy and how it is developing or not developing, which is another point, uh, way of putting it. Uh, let me also read the question, um, which tackles another very interesting field. Um, what is NATO's position on tech warfare and how decisive can it become in the near future? Two different topics, very broad topics. Uh, you're free to answer as long as you want. So let me talk with the concept of strategic autonomy. You know, I think the challenge as all of this, and we, we have a lot of conversations here, words matter, right? Words matter how you hear them in your own language, how they're translated and interpreted into other languages. And sometimes the first time you hear them is the one that sticks in your head and it's very hard to get it out of your head when you hear it later. There's a little bit of a backup on this. So, if your sense of strategic autonomy is that there's no place for the United States, or Canada, or the United Kingdom in Europe, and that there's an idea that the future of European security is one that's not at all linked to our Euro-Atlantic Partnership Agreement, then I think you'll find some frustration in Washington and other folks who have invested a lot in this Euro-Atlantic space because we truly believe that we're stronger together and that um, and this is where we end up. But I think there's other maybe interpretations of strategic autonomy that have been less in the headlines, maybe outside of the, of the political rhetoric or some ideas behind the concept of strategic autonomy that are worth discussing. And that is, are there certain things that the EU should be able to do, should it wish to, without needing assistance from NATO or from a non-NATO partner? And if so, is that something that they should invest in? And I think that's a very reasonable conversation. I think from our perspective, we also recognize, however, that one's ability to invest in security and defense has to compete with other needs. We have in NATO a tried and true, we have the most powerful political military alliance in history that is dedicated to peace, deterrence, and defense. We have also advanced some of the best capabilities within that NATO alliance by working in a partnership model. So we would not want to see a concept of European defense that develops either in a complete separation from, more importantly, 
in direct competition to the investments that we have made in the NATO alliance. And I'm heartened because there was actually an agreement reached just this past year, just a couple of months ago, signed between the NATO and the EU that would begin to look at how to approach some of these defense investments further down the road in a way that will serve both countries as they move forward. So I think it's an important conversation to have, but it's an important conversation to have with the right terminology, with the right understanding of our partners in terms of what we're really talking about here. And trust is part of this, confidence is part of this, but some basic economic rationale is also part of this. There are going to be certain things that it would be make no sense for a single country or two or three countries or even the European Union as a whole to develop independently and still be able to do all of those other things that they want to do for their population. So while you have in NATO tried and true history, next year, we're gonna have the 75th anniversary of NATO in Washington. Think about that. Think about the experience that has been built over time, the relationship, the partnerships, the plans that have been built upon. And when you have that, to make investment decisions that are not tied to that in some way um, uh, would be, I think, a big mistake. And in a sense, uh, and I'm not sure I, I understood the second question very well, but I'm going to interpret it this way, because that brings us to the case of technology, right? So technology is something that we are all going to have to take a very close and hard look at. Technology is both transformative, but in the initial stages, quite expensive. Um, and so we are in a position where some of the competitors, and I'll use that word, are advancing the use of technology in military for military purposes in a way that we should be concerned about. Because some of this technology doesn't have the rules and regulations that we have built into agreements over time that we've had, for example, on conventional forces, um, on nuclear forces and other things. And so we really don't know this space that we're, space, that's sorry, no pun intended, but, um, but, but this, this, this new area that we're, that we're entering. So a couple of factors to consider about this. One is how are we serving each other as a NATO alliance in terms of the early stages of the tech innovation? Are we investing appropriately in research and development uh, that serves the alliance? Is that something that we need to do on a purely national basis or are there ways to do it through NATO? And there's a new, new office stood up in NATO in the past few years, which I'm only beginning to learn about that is looking at some of these leading technology and how do you integrate that into your procurements and your decisions and your discussions as you think through the security forces that you will need for the future. So we have to think through all of that space. Is it economic? Does it make sense to come together to provide some of this technology? Can technology actually help us as we look at defense investments with some of the military equipment that we already have? Do we have to buy new equipment or do we have to modernize it through some of the technological advances that are available? This is where NATO can also help governments make good decisions about how they defend, how they spend those those precious defense dollars, because all of this costs money as you go down the line. And then I think we have to have a more, if you will, social sciences kind of discussion about the role of technology and warfare and the system of, you know, of laws and at least standards and doctrine that should be developed around the use of this and how we're going to use it and engage with it. That's a really difficult dis discussion. Um, I think probably some of the students in the room are, are going to have to grapple with that um, as we move forward. So it's a, I mean, it's a huge area. Um, and, you know, to wrap it back up to where you started, Christina, this is exactly why we don't consider it necessarily helpful to be having completely separated discussions in the NATO and EU space because the complexity of both the challenges and the complexity of the opportunities that technology are going to present to us are simply too big for any one country, 
frankly, even the United States to chew on all by themselves. So we might as well come together in a collective alliance and think about how we put technology to work for us, tied to those very principles that underline both NATO and the EU in very different ways. Thank you so much. And if you allow me, also considering, as, as you've mentioned, um, the strength and the, the, the size of this alliance in, in every sense, it would also make sure that all together, let's, uh, we, we can establish the, the rules that govern that world, that kind of technological world and realm. And uh, you know, we, we, can, we should really have a say considering all those things that you have mentioned. Um, Maricruz, I don't know whether there is any other question in the room. Maybe you can, you, you have some questions yourself. So the question in the room? No, I have a lot of questions <laughs> and I am in the room. Probably I can, there is no question in the room? Sure. No question in the room. I don't know if in the chat there is other question. I, I have no more questions here. I have many more myself, uh, yep. but if, uh, I don't want to, to abuse the time of, of the ambassador. Maybe just one final point here that has, hasn't been mentioned. And, and with that, if, if nobody, nobody else uh, writes in this time, we will, we will finish with that. What about China? China is in the new strategic concept. It's considered both you know, in the US and the EU as a challenge in, in different ways, as, as you say, words matter and each uh, part uses uh, different, different terminology to refer to China. But how about China in this North Atlantic um, view of the world? And if you let me, uh, Christina, about China and, uh, and Europe, uh, I, I think this is the main problem uh, to work about the defense uh, with the with the state, because sure we share value, we share way of life, uh, but with China, for instance, we don't share interests. And I, I think for the European uh, defense, the main problem has been during all this time, uh, we we didn't have the same threat. Uh, we are different. This is our, our lemma, no? uh, uh, unity in the difference. But uh, if we have not the same enemy, we don't, if we don't have the same interest with the other, it's quite difficult to organize a common defense. And this is with China, we have the, the main problem with, uh, with, with the United States to work together. Uh, even if now, well, after 11 September, we have discovered you don't need uh, uh, quite a, a specific technology or quite a, a specific weapon to to make the work. Now, Putin has uh, beef up uh, a back, uh, back uh, few, you know, the, but uh, uh, how, how to, to arrive at common, a common defense before China and the, the global uh, the global world, not only China, no, because China is mean also China in Africa, China in South America. What is your point of view? Thank you. So big question, important question. And I would say that's something that our political leaders are grappling with right now. Um, as a matter of fact, I had the opportunity to go with General Cavoli to the Munich Security Conference. Munich Security Conference, as many of you know, has long been a place where some of the biggest discussions about European security take place. And I think that, you know, the, the profound takeaway that I had in Munich in March in Germany was number one, the absolute solidarity that exists uh, for Ukraine and for, its, uh, and, and for, for the uh, horrible position that it's been put in and, and the way it's coming out of it. Again, it's not, you know, without some concerns, but the solidarity is there. Number two, the agreement that we have much more, the United States and North America have much more in common with Europe than we have differences. And we need to focus on that commonality and those shared values um, because at the end of the day, that matters. And third, 
a big question mark about what to do about China. And I will be quite honest. Um, we in the United States for many years did not see the threat that China was becoming uh, until very recently. And I think we had an assumption that by trying to incorporate China into global discussions, into global formats, that we would have more positive influence on the development of their values and their interests and their objectives. But what we found in our bilateral relationship, but also our engagement with them in international organizations was that that was not the case. So now we find ourselves in a position, and I know, you know, Europe deals with this and addresses it, but we in the United States, we have an economy that is, that is deeply connected and intertwined with China's. And it's very difficult now to recognize this. COVID was probably, you know, the, the first awakening for us because so much of our daily consumption came from China, still does, by the way. And, you know, when ships stopped moving and, and factories stopped producing, all of a sudden we recognized that the daily comforts of life were no longer there. And we started to think about some of the other risks. And then frankly, we started seeing behavior um, from the Chinese that worried us, whether that was the, the the theft of intellectual property and ideas to their willingness to provide weapons to actors that were doing things around the world that we didn't agree with to the treatment of, you know, of, of, of human beings within their population that we did not assign to as our values. So now we're in a very, very difficult position with China. And, you know, our, our government um, has also recognized that we need to continue to work with China on certain issues. Um, we will have a very difficult time, if not impossible time, fighting climate change if we don't engage China in that discussion. But at the same time, we owe it to our citizens not to uh, exacerbate the vulnerabilities that we now have on China. Um, and we owe it to our partners to be honest with them about our concerns about what China is doing in other parts of the world to make them vulnerable, either through some of their debt financing, which has left countries' economies destroyed and unhelpful, whether it's their support um, uh, for armaments. And we have been made very, very clear to China that should they continue to, uh, should they fuel Russia's effort beyond the political, but by actual material support, then we would have a very, very difficult and difficult discussion with China on many of these issues. And I think the European Union is now struggling with that as well. Um, how do you do this as the EU? And how do you do this as individual countries? Recognizing that China has a deep and intertwined presence in Europe too. So we are going to both have to de-risk, I think is the words that, um, uh, that uh, Mrs. von der Leyen has used. And by the way, Secretary Blinken is now also using because it's a very good terminology. So we first have to de-risk from China and make sure that we're not leaving ourselves open to vulnerabilities that they might use against us. Secondly, we have to think about our ability to compete with them they're investing in the technological space and the research and uh, development phase in a way that maybe our countries haven't been. Sometimes, by the way, through unfair means um, and taking advantage of the openness and transparency of our society. Um, but we need to think about what is our, our own national response to that um, and to make sure that we are not just giving them the ground uh, for this kind of um, uh, behavior. And then thirdly, we need to think collectively about how do we begin to prepare for the kinds of threats that China might pose. And I think the most useful way to have the conversation is to look at the impacts of what China is doing so that this doesn't become um, uh, uh, West versus China conversation. We're not we're not trying to put China in a box um, that that isolates them, but we are trying to say we need to have a collective response to the challenges that the People's Republic of China, because of its investment in certain countries around the globe, because of its now ownership over critical materials that are essential to our supply chains because of its 
presence in international organizations that should be writing the rules on things like artificial intelligence and other things. And the fact that they come at the set of, uh, of issues with a different value set, those need to concern us. And we need to be open and honest with those with whom we share values about where those concerns are and figure out ways that we can ensure that the international organizations, for example, that we uh, rely on to enforce the rules and the regulations that we have built over time can be enforced. We never did that before, right? Because we didn't see it as a challenge. So this is not confrontation in the traditional military sense, but it is collective action. And I think this is where our political leaders are, are going to try to help us direct our efforts so that we're open and wide-eyed about China's actions and what it looks like around the globe that we are preparing ourselves and our own resiliency so that we are not vulnerable or as vulnerable to some of those actions. And then thirdly, that we're thinking proactively about retaking that ground, about retaking our voice in some of these very important international discussions so that, again, values and, and, and ways of life that we thought we would have moving forward, but have largely taken for granted, are not going to be changed or redefined or redrafted by a huge economy with a powerful military and an outsized political voice that doesn't agree with our values. And this goes back to you know where we started and why the Euro-Atlantic relationship is so important. Because between the United States and the Europeans, we have 50% of global GDP which means we are now in a position to make sure that these world discussions reflect our values, not America's values, because again, we share that 50%, not Europe's values. And maybe we're not gonna be happy with every single point in that platform that we take forward. But our values overall will now outweigh those who have a different set of values. And we need to remind ourselves that that is something that we fought for, that we built over time, and we now have to activate. And we can because we have this cohesion. So I think, you know, we all read the headlines sometimes and we see some concerning things coming out of political leader statements. But at the end of the day, I think we truly know um, where our future lies. And I think we'll be ready and prepared to defend it, uh, which is, again, what this is all about. So. Hope that answers both of those wrapped into one. I think this is a perfect closing. It summarizes the whole session, um, the purpose and the meaning of, of uh, this working together. And uh, also you have uh, made the point of, of how we have to be aware of our vulnerabilities in places where we didn't thought, uh, never thought were there. And uh, you at the, at the beginning of your talk, you also talked about uh, health, health issues and how yes. NATO got involved in health. And, and we, you know, I, I, I like to stress this, this sentence. Uh, three years ago, nobody thought that, uh, that a mask was a strategic thing. And nowadays we believe it may be so. So anyway, thank you so much for sharing with us your insights and knowledge. It's been extremely interesting. I'm sure the students have enjoyed and, and mostly learned a lot. And I also want to invite you all to participate in the competition. You know that that is the second part of our program. We have these sessions, these, these conversations, but we also encourage you to participate in the, in, the, in the competition. You have the rules on our website, and you also know that the winner will go to Brussels to visit NATO's headquarters and other institutions um, linked to European uh, security and defense. So I, the experience of former winners is really amazing. They, they, uh, they are very happy with that. So I really invite you to participate and encourage you to participate. And I thank you again, Ambassador, for being here. I thank you, Marie Cruz, for joining us in this session, for making it possible. It's been a pleasure having the Universidad de Sevilla in this, in this program. And of course, as always, I, I thank, I want to thank the team at the U.S. Embassy for partnering with us, working with us, and making this program possible. Thank you very much.